Hey you guys, it's your boy Josh Vision bringing to you my Vikings Season 4B Episode 16 review. The episode entitled Crossings. So, you know, first off again with the Wessex storyline, then go on to Cadigan, then go on to Cadigan, and then end it off with the best of the three, Vienna the arriving finally in the, in the Mediterranean. So, in regards to Wessex, it was a pretty quick scene. I wasn't expecting to see Eckbert and company. After what happened last week so suddenly, well, so quickly, I was kind of expecting to see them around episode eight instead of, you know, the previous, well, this current episode I'm reviewing, obviously. But yeah, it wasn't really that big a deal, though, in hindsight, because it was only like one scene. And then that one scene got a lot established. So Aether Wolf essentially wants to raise up an army for when Ragnar's sons return. But Eckbert isn't really concerned, or at least he says he's not concerned, because him and Ragnar understood each other in many ways, and Ragnar promised him that he was that he told his sons to seek vengeance on King Ayla, not Eckbert and his kingdom. But Eckbert's like, listen, you really gonna trust a pagan? And when he said after that was that, and I'm not talking about Ragnar, I'm talking about Ivar. And Eckbert's like, listen, he's a cripple. And then Aethelf's like, but he's still a Viking. That was a big that was that was such a big mistake you made, Father. You should have took Ivar out before he could tell his brothers. Which in hindsight, Aethelwolf was right. Oh, I can't wait for this shit. I can't wait to this shit to hit the fan with the great heathen army. Oh my god. But yeah, um Eckbert essentially but Eckbert's like Listen, it's what ebbs. And I believe Aethelwolf said to Eckbert, are you going to call? Are you gonna come along with me to help me raise the army? Eckbert's like, no. I'm just going to continue my teaching with Alfred. He's such a clever boy. He catches on quickly. At this point, Aethelwolf was very frustrated. But my opinion on this scene, Eckbert looked very sickly. He looked very ill. And I don't think it's just because of the whole morning of Ragnar, even though he clearly is mourning um, the loss of Ragnar. I feel as though he kind of knows, even though he won't say it, that he knows Ragnar's sons are going to not only take Ayla out, Blood Eagle his ass, but they're also going to Blood Eagle his uh, Blood Eagle Eckbert. So that's why he's so concentrated on building and constantly teaching Alfred. Because he's making Alfred essentially his true heir. The same way Ragnar was kind of brooming Bien and Ivar to be his true heir. So pretty much um, grooming the future, if you will. So that's pretty much um, all I have on Wessex. I'm going to get to Cadigan. So in Cadigan, we begin with the conversation with Lagatha and Astrid. And Astrid says to Lagatha at first, Ragnar is, you think Ragnar is dead. And Lagatha's like, nope, Ragnar can't be dead. Ivar didn't see him die. But Astra's like, what if he is dead? And Lagatha says, well, if he is dead, I have to take on the burden. Ragnar, did, he, she continues on by saying, Ragnar said it himself. He never wanted to be king. He never wanted power. It weighed him down and most likely tri uh, contributed to his own death. So I have to bear. I have to take the burden of my love because if I don't, I have so many shield maidens that look up to me, Torvi, you, etc., etc. And if I go to Valhalla and I don't take the like, if I don't take this burden before I go to Valhalla, what will the warriors over there say about me and whatnot? So I have to do this, even though in my heart of hearts I'm broken and shattered by Ragnar's death, but I have to move on. So, I believe after that scene, she's in bed with Astrid, and once again, she goes on about Ragnar being her love and all this and all this stuff. At some point, I feel as though Astrid really is going to confront Lyfta about saying, you know what, I understand he was your love, but he's dead, he's in the past, you know, show me some respect, because everyone knows. Everyone has that person in their life in which they had some history with, they loved whatever, but you don't bring old shit into your new shit. That just causes drama, 
and unnecessary bullshit. But I digress. I'm going to continue on. Um, but they fall asleep and like they hear something. And then she says she claims to see the vision of Ragnar standing right there. Even though when I saw it, I personally thought it was Ube. But to each his own. So she pretty much says, I know you're in Valhalla, my love, but don't ever leave me while I'm in this world. Just haunt me until I'm there with you. So after that, we have a scene with Ube and Sigurd taking a bath, but they're like literally covered, I mean, surrounded by like the shield maiden <laughs> security team. While Ivar's just sitting down, you know, kind of just cutting some twigs, thinking. You know, in his mind. And Sigurd and Ube are thinking about the best approach on how to take out Lagtha. Ube says, listen, if Ragnar's alive, there's a, possi there's a possibility that she might kill us. Then again, when he said that, I'm saying to myself, like, what fucking sense does that make? Like, if he's alive, then she might kill you. She wouldn't want to do that because you're his son's Period. What the fuck? But either way, he does make a, a good point after this. He says that it doesn't make sense for them just to go off and kill Lagatha. Because if they kill Lagatha right now, you know, they could easily be killed off and they haven't built any supporters yet. So they have to buy their time. The Sigurd's feeling this, but Sigurd say, okay, I can see what you're saying. But who's gonna control Ivar? And that's when they all look at when they when Boba look at Ivar, and Ivar is just in sense more so than usual. So we we have the scene right after which Ivar's in the mountain by himself, and Ivar's screaming in frustration, agony, and pain because not only did he lose his father, he also lost his mother. So the two people, ironically, you know who pretty much he loved the most, are now both dead. So, after this, um, I believe we have Lagatha entering the Great Hall, along with Torvi on one side, and Astrid on the other, and Ube Sigurd are present there as well. So, Lagatha pretty much mentions the fact that, as of right now, over the last few years, Kattegat has become the richest, most profitable trading region in the land. But also for the past few years, it, this place has been highly, like, it hasn't been, there has been no fortifications or any sort of protection for, for such a important re, uh, trading block here in the land, which she found to be really ridiculous. So she says that all young men, women, and children who are fit enough, they're going to help me, uh, Pretty much build fortifications and all that to protect our interests, etc. So anyone that agrees with her, you know, say, say I. And everyone agrees with her, with the exception of obviously Ube and Sigurd. And then we have Ivar just crawling into um, into the Great Hall. And Ivar is short, sweet, to the point. Lagtha, I challenge you to single combat. You didn't kill my mom because she was a bad queen. No. You killed my mom in cold blood because of ambition, because of envy, jealousy, and insecurity. And for that, I want revenge. But Ube tries to put his hand on Ivar calm him down. But Ivar was like, fuck that. He quickly removed, well, removed, I would say quickly slung <laughs> Ube's hand away from his shoulder. was like, get away from me, coward. Like this, calm in this, surprisingly. Like this, like, he's not a coward. He just understands the situation more than you. And Ivar said, once again, I just want to let you know, I understand the situation. And once again, I'm going to say, you killed my mom. I have ambition and jealousy and insecurity. I want revenge, single combat. Lactha says, no, son of Ragnar. 
And I was like, why? Why won't you face me? He says, because I don't want to kill you. And I was like, what makes you think you can kill me? You know, and the, his, just his line of it was just really, really good. You know, reminding me once again of Travis Phil, Phil, Phil's delivery you know, as, as Ragnar. But um, Lather says, I do. And then Ivar's like, you know what? Okay, you don't want to fight me. It's fine with me. But I just want you to know, and everyone around here to know, that one day, I will kill you, Ivar. And he said it so, with so much fury and focus and determination, but calmly. Like the eye of a storm. And he just crawled his ass away after that. Then you see, and it's funny, because right after that, Ube and Sigurd gave life to that look. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's so, that's that's the toughest one of the bunch right there. Him. The cripple. You in trouble now. <laughs> and then the look on Astrid's face was a look of concern on Torby's. And even Lactus' face was kind of shook. I believe after that, Lagatha spoke with the seer, and the seer says to Lagatha, No, I believe Lagatha asked her, Will I be killed by a son of Ragnar? And the seer is like, Yes, you will be. And it's kind of funny because right after that, Lagatha has a smile. You know, it's, just, it's, like, it's like to her, you know, that's her biggest honor. Her biggest honor would be to ki be killed by one of the sons of her love. I mean, the love of her life. And then we have, a right at that, we have Ivar. And his, look at like, Anakin Skywalker, when he turned the dark side, and that dark side robe with the hood on and shit. And we have this interesting, um, like, we have Ivar, essentially he's in his mind, whatever. But we have this, he sees Lagatha. And he's trying to put his knife to her eye. Honestly, it's not the real like the it's like a it's like a representation of what he wants to do to her. But he holds himself back. Once again, Ivar is known for his for always thinking of the long game, pretty much being very patient, rational, when the time fit and also striking and being extremely cruel, right? Like like that, when the time is right. So from what the seer said and the way that Ivar when he says he's going to do something, he tends to do it. I'm pretty sure that Lagatha's days are numbered, but I wouldn't say this season. I think she's going to die at some point during the second half of season five. That's what I think. And it's most likely will be the season finale. Because besides Ragnar, let's let's be honest here, who's, who's more prominent in the show than her? Besides Lagatha. We could say Rolo or Floki. But, you know, there's rumors of Floki, you know, going to Iceland in season five. So he's not going to die. And I believe the actor, Clive Standen, that plays Rolo in the series, he's also has a role in the upcoming prequel to one of those movies that Liam Neeson, oh, it's Taken, a prequel to the movie um, that of the movie Taken that starred Liam Neeson, but 20 years beforehand, obviously. But apparently he's going to be doing double duty, working for Viking 65 and doing that. So he's not going to die, at least during season five. So most likely it's going to be like the, but it's going to be a very monumental death, obviously like Ragnar's. But the point is just a matter of when, not if. Because the seer just said that straight, straight up, you're going to die the hands of one of Ragnar's sons. It could be Ivar. Then again, it could be Vixer. But Vixer hasn't said anything so far this episode. And he's very unpredictable. But we did get a little bit more of his personality, you know, in regards to the episode when it comes to the Mediterranean. So I'm entering the final stretch. So, we're, when it comes to Mediterranean, we have the Yerda Company. It's even though they're in a foggy place, and everyone assumes that they're lost. Rolo's like, that same thing Rolo thinks. Gary's like, listen, we're not lost. Have faith 
in the gauze, or did they driven that from you too fully? And while this is going on, we have the Finehair brothers talking to each other. King Finehair speaking um to Hafton. King Finehair says, I wonder if Ironside is cursed just like his father. And Hafton is like, what, what? Wait, no, he says something something else besides that. He says some he said one day we must overcome the Lothbrooks. But as we all know, King Finehair wants to be the king of all Norway. But Finehair also states that sometimes I wonder why not now? And the way he says why not now, it's like a almost a look of disgust, you know, at Beer and Einstein, just a Lothbrock family. In general, but have to tell them ease up, ease up. The gods will give us a sign. Just be patient. So finally, they get to the Mediterranean, and I believe they get to a port city in Spain, Espana. But there's a party or a celebration going on throughout the city. So we see these exotic foods, uh, jewelry, just dancing, all this stuff, and the Vikings. They get the boats. They kind of park it by destroying the boats that are already there, but they enter the city. And as soon as they enter the city, they go on a fucking rampage. The yearn is a scary fucker. He's scary as shit. The yearn has a steely eyed determination. Anyone that gets to the yearn's way, he cuts them down like that. Like two hits at best. If it's not with the fist, it's with the sword. Slice, slice, slice. Matter of fact, there was a point in which Dixert was actually um, eating a type of fruit, whatever. And one of the guys from the town attacked Dixert. And the way I saw this was going, it seemed as though Dixert, I don't know because if you remember correctly, especially um, it seemed as though Dixert and Ube are the fighters of the brothers, even though Ivar is very talented. I've heard the cripple, after all, despite being very talented and a killer, she was old Im- Ugh. Uba and Visser are the fighters of the group. You could arguably say Vixer is more of the fighter in terms of natural fight. So when I saw this scene, um, I didn't know how to make of it. I didn't know if the fact was Vixer isn't as tough as he thinks he is, or once again, it's more Vixer because he's still quite young, and he was caught off guard. Because if that's the case, it's kind of like what Ragnar did with Bjorn in season two when Bjorn and Lacta came back to help Ragnar take Kattegat back from Yal Borg, in which Ragnar told, I believe Bjorn wasn't ready and he almost died during during the fight and Lagatha and Ragnar had to sort of protect him, give him time for him to get his weapon. So I think that was sort of similar in that case, obviously in different situations, but similar in terms of like, listen, you're a warrior. Be prepared at all times for shit like this. Because that's kind of the look Bjorn gave Vixer when, when him and Vixer kind of faced the guy off with a double sword to the gut. Like, be ready, all right? This this ain't kiss anymore. This is live or die, you know, fight or, you know, stuff like that. So, anyways, we have Floki being tra- like in a trance-like state when hearing the Muslim call to prayer. He follows the voice into this temple. And although there's no gods, no idols there, he noticed the passion in which these people were worshiping their gods. And I believe before they even entered the city, Vixirk was, was like, he was a few, like, uh, woo, sorry people. Vixer was very, you could tell Vixer is definitely inherited the explorer side of Ragnar. He's looking on with very with so much like curiosity and so much of excitement, you know, as he looks on the inner, you know, the Mediterranean. He asks his BN, um, we don't have he tells me we don't have any water. And he's like, Yeah, I know we don't have that much water left. And also we need we need more provisions because we're about at, almost done damn near out of that shit too. And Vixert says, 
what do you think the people are like? What, 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 uh, and not just that, what will they think of us? And they're like, I don't know. I've never been here before. I know nothing. And Rolo mentions the fact that they're called Muslims. So I just had to say that because one, <laughs> I kind of forgot that was like literally the first part when it comes to like the whole Mediterranean, you know, storyline of this episode. And it connects to the Floki thing because Floki is seen to be very interested and very, uh, it's kind of gives him a sense of peace because once again, before they got off, you know, before they got off into this town, this port city in Spain, Floki is mentioned to Helga that he feels lost. He feels like an empty vessel and that he needs a purpose to go on. And Helga's like, but you build both. He's like, I need something more than that. So Helga mentions the fact that she wants another baby. Floki's like, fuck that. No, I don't want another baby. <laughs> Screw that. But, usually, just like in life, women tend to get their way anyways. Because, during this whole little massacre that went on with Rolo cutting throats and Hafton and fine hair cutting throats, knees, and gutting people's stomachs, Helga finds a girl who King Finehair and his brother killed both of her parents before her eyes. So the girl runs away. Helga finds her. And I can assume she pretty much is good. She, she's around what Helga says. They're, what her Floki daughter who died in season four, the first half of season four, what age she would have been if she had lived. So she essentially is taking her on to be her like like her adopted daughter in a sense. So, anyways, back to the folk situation. Fine hair and Hafton. Well, Hafton cut, I believe, one of the people's heads off like it was nothing, saying that he was annoyed with the music. And Folky essentially says to them, Listen, don't kill any of these people. Because if you do, you have to go through me. So they look at each other and find him. Like, okay, Floki. All right. All right, you guys. Let's not kill any more people in this temple. But outside, fair game. And it's kind of ironic because Barnier looks at Floki in a way kind of how Floki used to look at Appleston. And that's the interesting thing I found about the scene. Fine hair was really... <laughs> fine hair. After was really looking at Floki like that. And it's kind of interesting. It seems as though over the years, Floki is starting to maybe subconsciously take in Ragnar's, you know, his things about curiosity and seeing more than just your own culture, just seeing the benefits of other cultures, you know. But I just found that very interesting because I feel as though that's sort of teething a conflict in regards to Floki and Hafton, you know, for the upcoming season. But anyways... Let's continue on. So we have Rolo, Bien, and Vixer and company go through this uh, another building. And when they go through this building, Bien's cutting down people. So is Rolo and Vixer. Um, at one point, they're like in a, in a hallway full of mirrors. And it's kind of funny because Bjorn and Vixer, especially Vixer, which, like I said before in one of my reviews, Vixer literally represents Ragnar's lightheartedness. When Ragnar is not so serious and whatnot, and he's just in a jokey, funny mood. Because Vixer was so, like, giggling when he kept like, seeing himself in the mirror. Like, you see one mirror, the other mirror, then you turn around, another mirror. He's just like, <laughs> you know, hysterical about it. Um, I believe at one point, there was this um, guard who clearly killed himself. And Bian was about to cut him down and Rolo stopped him. He said, that's not it, Rolo finds the key in the guard's shirt and they open the to the, do, the lock to the door or whatever and we find a fucking harem and Vixer is excited he's like you know he's like a kid in the candy store and Bian is looking around like damn same thing with Rolo and they proceed to have sex with these women along with um the other men well okay not like that like like Bian 
like pretty much the other Vikings and the and company have sex with the with the women. Yeah. So Fine Hair and his group eventually meet up with Bjorn and his group, and they also have sex with the harem of women and shit. So you could tell Fine Hair and Hafton when they have sex because they start singing that creepy like song that they were taught as children by their parents. So that's pretty much a sign that they did. So at this point, the Vikings are done. The end of the company are done. The harem, of, the harem of women, they're being taken back to Kaga. I'm assuming as slaves. And there's one girl that catches Bien's eye. I mean Bjorn's eye. Um, and Helga essentially tells Floki. Floki says, "Who's the girl? And you're not gonna take her as our daughter." Helga's like, "Essentially, fuck you. I am." So yeah, she's officially adopted. You guys without the papers. So, essentially, that's kind of it when it comes to the Mediterranean. Now we're going to get to the fucking last five minutes of this episode, which was fucking awesome. We see Bien, Vixer, Rolo, Hafton, and Finehair on a mountain looking over the Mediterranean Sea. They have Finehair giving Bien his props. He's like, you're right, Ironside. We finally made it. To the Mediterranean and it's beautiful. And Baron was like, We finally made it to a place that our people never thought was even, you know, was here in the world. It was even possible. We went even farther than Ragnar, my fa- our father, when you know was speaking to Vixer for that. As soon as this shit happens, then we see crows. We hear crows. But it seems as though Vixer and Bien are the only ones that notice the crows. And then while this is going on, we see Ivar in the blacksmith shop. And I think he he um hear crows as well. And then Uba, he's uh chopping up his his arrow, his arrowhead. He sees crows. Then Sigur, he showed up his axe. He sees crows. And then we see Odin making his way. It's a cat again. And then when it comes to Ivar and Uba and Sigur, and he tells them, your father is dead. Ube breaks his own arrow. Sigur is beside himself like, damn, he really died. And Ivar yells in even more fury than he did earlier this episode. When it comes to dead and just the emotion on his face was heartbreaking and that emotion of like damn and then you have Ragnar's voiceover from the previous episode his speech about he makes no apologies for his death and the things that he's done or his faith in that he's gonna wait until his sons die to bask in their stories of triumph we have literally a flash, like a little bit of, I mean, of, of the place where Ragnar died. Cadigan, Wessex, all that stuff. And that's where the episode ended, folks. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you guys for watching my video. Um, you guys can like my channel, subscribe to my channel, write some comments down below. And in regards to comments, sorry, I haven't been able to write back. Um, something's wrong for some reason. I can't write back to you guys when you guys comment. I'm gonna have that fixed. Speak with YouTube about that. Kind of weird, but it's whatever. Um, once again, thank you guys. Uh, have an awesome night.